All right, let's go back through the text and just kind of talk about the different parts. Um, I'd like to talk about the narrator and his implications about his friend Gilray. I'd also like to talk about some parts that may have been confusing for students as they read. So, as you may have understood by now, this story is about a man who was tasked at watering his friends, his friends, uh, chrysanthemum, which is a really hard word for me to say, so if I mess that up as I read, I apologize. Um, and then the process of procrastination that the narrator has throughout the course of the text. So procrastination is the action of delaying or postponing something, and here the act that the narrator is postponing was the watering of the flower pot. The story starts off with uh, the narrator saying that he charges Gilray's unreasonableness to his ignoble passion for cigarettes. So because that is an important first line, I'm just going to start highlighting and annotating it because it may be important for an understanding of the text later on. Here, basically what the narrator is saying is that he is suggesting that his friend Gilray's unreasonableness, his insanity, the fact that he puts so much stock and value in a single flower is due to his unnoble or ignoble passion for cigarettes. So if you look down at the bottom here at number one, the subtext, ignoble means not honorable, not noble. If you have an understanding of the prefix ig, you'll understand that it is Latin, meaning not, or to not know. So here, he's saying that he is blaming his friend for the fact that the pot was not watered because his friend is insane, because his friend is overpassionate or perhaps addicted to cigarettes or nicotine, which later on we read the narrator also seems to be addicted to. And the story of his flower pot has therefore an obvious moral or an obvious uh, truth value, an idea of what is right or wrong, having high or lacking some sort of principle. Later on, it says, the want of dignity he displayed about the flower pot on his return to London would have made anyone sorry for him. So here, Dignity means the quality of being worthy of honor, and so it's saying that um, Gilray's putting too much value on this flower pot and kind of is a little bit crazy, and so the narrator, as well as anyone else in the audience, should probably start to feel bad for this character. And here, along with the rest of the text, is where the narrator begins to justify his actions to try and provide reasons as to why he didn't water the pot in the first place. He says that I had my own work to look after and really could not be tending this chrysanthemum all day. After he came back, Gilroy, after Gilroy came back, however, there was no reason, reasoning with him, and I had to admit that I never did water his plant, though always intended to do so. So now we go into various parts of the text where he talks about his day, the narrator talks about his day-to-day -day experiences and uh, struggle to actually get out to Gilray's place and water the plants. It starts off in the second paragraph saying, the great mistake was in not leaving the flower pot in charge of William John, who we later learn, uh, perhaps through inference, is Gilray's attendant or perhaps even servant. No doubt I readily promised to attend to it, but Gilray deceived me by speaking as if the watering of a plant was the merest pastime. So again, the narrator is trying to push the blame away from himself and try and put the blame on other people, whether that be Gilray, William John, or perhaps other people mentioned throughout the course of the text. Gilroy had to leave London for a short provincial tour, so that means that Gilroy is traveling around the various providences surrounding London. And the narrator says that Gilroy took advantage of the narrator based off of the narrator's good nature. So the next paragraph says, As Gilroy had owned his flower pot for several months, during which time, and I take him at his word. So I'm going to highlight this section right here because it seems important again to me. Uh, I take him at his word suggests that perhaps the narrator believes that he was being misled, that maybe Gilroy wasn't being totally honest or truthful with him throughout the course of the text. 
He's saying that Gilroy said, according to his word, that he watered the plant daily. But now the narrator's calling that idea into question. He's wondering, was that actually the case? Later throughout the text, the audience might wonder, did Gilroy even have a plant in the first place? Or was he hoping that the narrator would never go water the plant and then therefore have a reason to pass blame onto his friend? We're not too sure, and I'll come back to that point later on in the text. It says he had watered it daily. He must have known he was misleading me. He said that you got into the way of watering a flower pot regularly, just as you wind up your watch. So I don't know about you, but most people nowadays aren't winding up their watches. So this is a good part of the text that gives a clue as to um, the time period that it's being written. And we might infer that the time period where this was being written was the late 1800s. Again, nowadays people don't wind up their watches and more so they have Apple watches and if anything, they just need to charge them. This certainly is not the case, the narrator says, I always wind up my watch and I never watered the flower plant. So he's saying, it's apples and oranges, bro. I Winding up my watch is part of my daily routine, but you're asking me to do this thing that's totally out of context, totally out of my comfort zone, so I can't possibly do that. I always wind up my watch and I never watered the flower plant. Of course, if I had been living in Gilroy's rooms, the thing always before my eyes, I might have done so. I proposed to take it into my chambers, but then Gilroy, that darned Gilroy, wouldn't let him take it home. So... How Gilroy came upon this chrysanthemum, it's unclear, but perhaps it was given to him as a gift. The narrator here says, he should not have made a clean breast of it to me it is another matter. So to have a clean breast is an idiomatic phrase. And an idiom is a phrase that's not deducible based off of the definitions of the words being used. A good example is it's raining cats and dogs. Um, that phrase means that it's raining really hard out, not that cats and dogs are falling from the sky. It is important in your writing to be careful when using idiomatic language because it's really difficult for English learners to understand idioms because if they don't know the phrase and they only know the definitions of the words being used, they may be very confused. So here, the idiom, make a clean breast of it, means to confess someone's wrongdoing. So I do not inquire, but whether in the circumstances he confessed his wrongdoings is another matter. Undoubtedly, it was an unusual thing to put a man to the trouble of watering this plant daily without giving him its history. So again, the narrator is trying to put the blame on someone else. He's trying to justify the fact that he forgot to water the plant. At this point, the narrator has pointed out that he's been misled and uses that as a reasoning as to why he didn't water the plant. He suggests that watering the plant was out of routine and he just couldn't make an effort to remember. And then he also suggests that um, in the next paragraph that it would be one thing to ask somebody to water a plant, but another thing to ask them to leave, to take a leave of absence merely to run home and water this plant so that he had to work. And to leave work just to water a plant would be unreasonable. So in uh, the passage, as we continue reading, let's start off here. So if we scroll forward a little bit ahead, it says that when the narrator reached home, he was tired and inclined to take things easily. Another reason why he couldn't water this pot. And then he would have visitors drop in. And those visitors being friends, he couldn't just give up his friendships. He couldn't just say, hey, hang on a second, guys. I know you came over to my house to hang out with me, but uh, let me just take 40 minutes to go water this dude's plant, and then I'll come back. No, instead, he says, as is his normal routine, he started smoking his pipe, talking to his friends, and if his friends weren't around, he would start to read a novel, um, start to read. And uh, so it says, often when I was in the middle of a chapter, Gilroy's flower pot stood up before my eyes crying for water. Um, so he's saying, you know, it's not like he wanted 
to let the plant die, but rather um, he was in the middle of something. He was busy reading or having visitors, and this thought was only a passing uh, thought to water the plant, and oftentimes he would forget in the course of things. So um, where I lost myself was not in the hurrying to his rooms at once with a tumbler. I said to myself that I would go when I had finished my pipe, but again, this escaped the narrator's memory. In the next paragraph, it says, all three weeks he was away, Gilroy kept pestering me with letters. So now he's saying, not only is Gilroy asking some unreasonable favor, but also he's hearkening on him. He's, he's uh, pestering him. He's bothering him with these constant and incessant letters. And so he's saying the letters aren't outrightly trying to ask the narrator to water the plant, but rather in a roundabout way. Often they took the form of postscripts, post meaning after. These are the PSs that people write at the bottom of letters or perhaps emails. Uh, if you've ever seen someone write PS, I love you, that's postscript. Post meaning after the writing, script meaning writing. By the way, are you watering my chrysanthemum? Or the chrysanthemum ought to be a beauty by this time. Or you might be quite adept now at watering plants. So the narrator is starting to take offense at Gilray's letters, suggesting that uh, Gilray doesn't trust the narrator, also suggesting that Gilray um, is you know, more so bothered about the fact that the narrator isn't watering the plants or perhaps not watering the plants than really connecting on a friendship level, which, you know, if your friend is calling you to see if you're doing some sort of task rather than to talk with you and connect with you, that might be something that puts a damper on the relationship, uh, something that might be a little bit detestable to you. So the narrator says that Gilray suggested that the narrator wrote him saying, I had just been watering your plants. But the narrator says that I wrote no such thing. And if I did write something like that, I must have meant that I would water the plant after I had written that letter. But he has never been able to bring this home. Gilroy has no proof that this letter actually existed. And so it's kind of this bickering back and forth, pointing the blame, pointing fingers at each other to try and say, who actually ended up killing the plant? Was it the narrator's lack of water? watering the plant? Or did the plant even exist? Or was the plant perhaps already dead before Gilray even went on vacation? Um, and Gilray was just using this as leverage in his friendship with the narrator. And then the narrator says the annoyance that he had increased as Gilroy started writing postcards, not just letters, but postcards, and sending them to the narrator's house. The narrator would be excited for an important delivery or communication, but would only find that it was another postcard from Gilray about this stupid flower pot, this, this bane of his existence at the moment. It was almost as if Gilray was haunting the narrator. So now the narrator is starting to get nervous because Gilray's trip around England is starting to come to an end and still the narrator hasn't watered this plant. So he says, you know, I ordered some water, I rang for water, but when the servant brought me water, he misunderstood that I wanted it to water the plants and rather thought it was going to be a sort of uh, mixer for alcohol. And so he left it on the stand next to the tumbler, which is a cup usually meant for a liquor. Um, and then <laughs> the narrator again forgets. Um, later on, he gets to Gilray's house and he meets the, the housekeeper, starts to talk to her and loses the opportunity again. He says, another time I was actually on the stair rushing to Gilray's door when I met the housekeeper and stopping to talk to her, lost my opportunity again. To show how honestly anxious I was to fulfill my promise, I needed only add that I was several times awakened in the watches of the night by a haunting consciousness that I had forgotten to water Gilray's flower pot. So again, it's almost as if Gilray is haunting the narrator. He's waking up in the middle of the night. He's making actual efforts to get out to this guy's house, but things just keep messing up uh, his opportunity to water the plant. 
And so in the middle of the night when he's awakened by his subconscious to water this plant, he does things to try and remind himself in the morning rather than get up and go water the plant at the time because he said, why would he? And also he wouldn't want to disturb his neighbors. He throws things on the floor. He knocks over chairs so that when he wakes up, he'll see the disheveled room and it will be a sort of spark in his mind, almost like tying a string around your finger, a reminder to go and water Gilray's plants. Gilray's response to this was that these were just fool's tricks, that the narrator should have gone and just done the deed that he promised he would do. But like I said, why would the narrator disturb his neighbors in the middle of the night? Besides, could I reasonably be expected to risk catching my death of cold for the sake of a wretched plant? So the narrator's trying to not only justify the fact that he did try and go water the plant, but also that it's an unreasonable request, especially unreasonable to go out in the middle of the night and try and water this plant in such cold and harsh conditions. He says, you know, I've heard of people doing such things for, uh, you know, their loved ones, perhaps for a young lady who might seek lilies in dangerous ponds or edelweiss. And perhaps if, if uh, a person was so compelled by love, they might go and uh, overcome this dangerous overhanging cliff to gather these flowers for their loved one. But Gilray certainly isn't the narrator's loved one. And the narrator even kind of throws in a quick jab. He says, I feel certain that Gilray is nobody's loved one. So nearing the end of the text, the narrator says, I come now to the day prior to Gilray's return. So the three weeks have passed. The narrator still has not watered Gilray's plants. And now Gilray's going to return the next day. So he had just reached his office. Uh, he works for the government in some fashion. Um, and he remembered the plant. So he realized this was his last chance. So he hires a cabbie and he tells the cabbie to go drive to Gilray's Inn. And after 20 minutes, finally make it, makes it to Gilray's door with a large watering can in hand. And upon opening the door, he runs into Gilray's butler or servant, William John. And he says, where's the plant, Mr. Gilray's chrysanthemum? He cries, where is the plant? And William John's like, dude, the plant's been dead for weeks now, or at least for several days. He had thrown out the plant because it had died. So at this point, the narrator realizes that there's no coming back. Gilroy is going to return the next day, find his plant dead, and there's going to be very few excuses as to why the plant wasn't watered. And so some of the excuses, again, that uh, the narrator comes up with are that Gilroy himself had misled him, that watering the plant was out of routine, that he had to work, that he was tired, that he had visitors, or perhaps got entrenched in a deep chapter in his novel. He had forgotten. He'd lost track of time. He was getting annoyed by Gilray's letters. He puts the blame on others, such as the butler himself. He keeps forgetting, forgetting. He didn't want to disturb his neighbors in the middle of the night. He didn't want to catch a cold. And again, he blames William John. Why hadn't William John watered the plant? Gilroy should have originally asked William John to water the plant. It's not the narrator's fault. Yet, it is his fault, and he realizes this. So when Gilroy, Gilroy returns, he steers clear from Gilroy. It says that he coolly told me the plant was dead. It says that I went to the theater that night to keep myself from thinking, and all the next day I contrived or devised or planned or plotted to remain out of Gilroy's sight. When we met, he was meaning Gilroy, was stiff and polite. Gilroy was upset. He did not say a word about the chrysanthemum for a week, and then it all came out in a rush. And I let him talk, with the servants flinging out flower pots faster than I could water them. What more could I have done? So throughout this entire text, the narrator has been pretty hyperbolic. And by hyperbolic, I mean over-exaggerative. And here's an excellent example of not only hyperbole used in the text, but also hyperbole used as part of the dialogue from the narrator. It says, with the servants flinging out the flower pots faster than I could water them. 
So again, he gives a further excuse as to why the water pot, the chrysanthemum, the plant was not watered. He blames it on the servants. He says, you know, your servants keep throwing away all the things, all the tasks that you ask me to do. How could I have possibly done them in the first place? So the friendships kind of come to an end. A coolness between the two becomes inevitable. This, the narrator regretted, but his mind was finally made up that he would never do another favor for Gilray again. 